Sen ehkä sinne jakaa siitä. Hi everyone, welcome to the webinar. We will get started in just a few minutes. In the meantime, if you want to tell us where you're dialing in from and telling us what stakeholder you hope to learn more about on our webinar today, being that we have uh, a ton of focus on stakeholder engagement with Breakfast After the Bell. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Anyone at any point can still enter their answer in that uh, in the chat box, the box, the question of what stakeholder do you hope to learn more about today? Um, because there's a lot, a lot happening with the buy-in and breakfast after the bell. So we'd love to know sort of your perspective as you're coming into the webinar. So let's go ahead and get started. Hannah, you can go to the next slide. Welcome everyone. This is Rise and Shine, Breakfast After the Bell and the Power of Stakeholder Support. We are so excited you're joining us today. We have such wonderful things to share with you. Next slide, Hannah. And I have just a few housekeeping notes before we begin. This webinar is being recorded. Uh, we will share the recording with all of the registered attendees along with the slide deck after the recording. And then we will also have this webinar living on the Center for Best Practices site so you can access it at any time and share it with your networks. The chat box is always there for you to share information or to engage with other attendees. And then there's the question and answer box at the bottom of the Zoom screen as well. If you have questions, feel free to pop those into the chat box at any point in time. We will have time at the very end for Q&A, but feel free to pop your questions in as soon as they um, come to mind and we might be able to answer them in real time as well. And then if you need the service of closed captioning, that is also available and it's a little button on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Next slide. All right, so this is a 60 minute webinar. I'm gonna start us off with introductions of who's on the webinar. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Breakfast After the Bell, but the bulk of this webinar is gonna be for our amazing speakers today to share their experience about stakeholder buy-in in in their districts. And then we'll have some time at the end for question and answer. So I am Summer Kriegshauser. I am a senior program manager here at Share Our Strength, and I'm delighted to be with you all today. We have dynamic speakers um, from different coasts. We have Deb representing Mechanicville City School District in New York. She will be talking about student, family, and community buy-in in in relation to Breakfast After the Bell. And we have Fasat and Christina representing Rialto Unified School District in California, and they will be focusing on principal buy-in. So we have stakeholder buy-in covered uh, pretty much across the board in terms of how to make that Breakfast After the Bell program work because we know stakeholder buy-in is so valuable. Next slide. So breakfast after the bell, when I say breakfast after the bell, I am talking about alternative serving models where breakfast is served after the official start of the school day and students are allowed to eat outside of the cafeteria, whether it's in the classroom 
or other places within the school or um, perhaps common areas, as an example. The three most common models are breakfast in the classroom, where breakfast is served and eaten in the classroom, grab and go to the classroom, where students pick up breakfast on their way to the classroom, and then second chance breakfast, which is just another, not, another opportunity to grab breakfast later on in the morning. So this could be between first and second period or sometime between breakfast and lunch. This can be served breakfast in the classroom style or grab and go to the class or grab and go style. But this is just really breakfast later on in the day uh, to capture those students who aren't hungry first thing in the morning. And then making breakfast a part of the school day, we know that it addresses those common barriers that traditional cafeteria breakfast causes, and it ensures more students are able to start the day with a healthy meal because we know breakfast after the bell does a very good job of meeting the students where they are um, and meeting those needs. Next slide. So breakfast after the bell, we think it sets an equitable playing field. We know that it ensures more children have access to a nutritious, nutritious meal. There's so many variables at play in the morning. So no matter how a student has arrived at school, whether it's the bus or carpool or walking, uh, what food a student had available in the morning at their own home, or when a student's hunger comes on, um, you know, they might have that hunger later in the morning, breakfast after the bell sets an equitable playing field. It also is able to meet the unique needs of the school building and the culture. And this is why there's those three different models. You can mix and match and really um, meet the needs of the students uh, for what their timeline is and what their needs are. And then it brings school breakfast into the school day, just like lunch. And so it becomes an integral part of the school culture and a part of the daily schedule. Next slide. And we know, and I know you know this, students who don't eat breakfast are hangry students and they have a harder time concentrating and they might have more school nurse visits. They might not be focused in the classroom or might be disruptive. Um, and so school breakfast is more than just addressing um, nutrition, it's addressing various other just basic needs that kids have uh, so they can learn so they can be focused, um, so they can be attentive, and so they can not be distracted by hunger. Next slide. And so with that, I'm excited to pass the mic to Deb at Mechanicville City School District for her to talk about her experience in stakeholder buy-in. So Deb, take it away. Hi, everybody. Nice to meet you all. I'm always um, thinking to myself before we start these things, does anybody really know anything about me? So I'm gonna preface this with, I've been in, in food service for over 50 years, started in a little mom and pop place, worked in some big hotels, did a stint with long-term care, assisted living, and now I'm a school lunch lady. I found my passion. Um, we're gonna go right into the first slide and I'm gonna tell you what I do every day at work. We're talking about buy-in from students, from my staff, from the people that work in the school district and especially families and communities. The beginning of that is being diverse. Next slide. Getting the buy-in. I'm finding the longer I'm in school nutrition, the more I realize that even more important than getting the kids in the door, it's getting all the people who plant those seeds to the kids the administration, the teachers, their parents, even the Board of Education, and especially the community. You need to market your program. I'm finding that social media can be our best friend or our absolute worst men enemy. I have a group of students that belong to a uh, food service advisory committee. They are from third grade to 12th grade, um, and they kind of flow in and out through the, throughout the year, so they change a little bit. Last year, one of my dietetic interns met with these kids and Ask them, do you know that Mrs. Mackey takes a picture every morning of what she has for breakfast and posts it first thing? So you'll know if you want to have breakfast. And the sixth grade student's response was, tell Mrs. Mackey that Facebook is for old people. And if she wants to reach us, she needs to hit Instagram. So before the end of that day, um, I'm an Instagram, not really a guru, but I can post a picture on there every day. And I do. And it has made a difference. The kids do come and they want to be part of it. So social media, it's a winner. If you're not doing it, you should try to do it. And think diversity. 
Kids want to feel like they belong. They want to feel like their opinions matter. I have a suggestion box in both of my buildings. I have a, a pre-K through five building with about 608 kids in it. And my high school is six through 12. We have 744 kids in the building. There's a suggestion box in both cafeterias. And I make an announcement or post something on social media that I want them to talk to me on Tuesday. And that's what we call it, Talk to Me Tuesday. There's a little... Um, stack of little papers and pencils. So each day when the kids come through the cafeteria line, the cashier might remind them that they, if they have an opinion, a suggestion, a gripe or complaint, something they don't like, drop it in the box. My food forum kids will retrieve those things and we talk about them and we try to make those changes as soon as we can. I think most importantly, make food fun. I want my kids when they come through the door to know that it's the best meal they might get that day or maybe all week. I think that you need to think about presentation. When the kids come in and we're serving uh, bacon cheeseburger with French fries, they want that to look like your favorite place that they go to eat where they're getting a bacon cheeseburger. So presentation is a big deal for me. And I want my staff to taste every single thing that we make. I think it's most important to change parents' perception of what school lunch is. Most of those parents think all we serve is grilled cheese sandwiches and Elio's frozen pizza squares. And it's really just not like that anymore, not in any school district that I'm aware of. Next slide. Involve your students. I have uh, at least four Iron Chef competitions each year in my junior, senior high. I don't think my elementary kids are quite ready for it, but when we talk at Food Forum, they know that they're going to be able to participate in that when they come to high school. And my Iron Chef always revolves around some meal component where the kids are required to create a recipe, tell me what they need to have available to make their item. We encourage them to have a staff member and an, a friend, could even be a parent, but always one staff member as a mentor. And these kids come right in my kitchen and they prepare an item. We have blind judging, usually a board of education member, the superintendent, the principal, the nurse, always someone from social media, our local newspaper. They come and they vote. And then the winning team's entree gets placed on the following month's menu. So we take a lot of pictures, post them on our uh, big screens on the in the cafeteria so the kids get to be famous for a little bit and that has grown tremendously the last one I did at the end of the school year last year I had 14 teams that's a lot of kids in my kitchen and we're doing that during meal service kids are seeing it but it is so tremendously successful and that little creating that little buzz makes a big difference in getting kids to come through the door um, program participation, it's going to increase if your kids are involved. That is the bottom line. It will increase if your kids are involved. And if the parents know that the kids are involved. I did a little stat over on the right-hand side of the slide about the breakfast and meals that we did before and after COVID. And this year, my school is a CEP school. I'm absolutely thrilled. My participation at breakfast or at lunch right now is about 54%. I'd probably be higher than that after today. Um, and that's great for us the first couple of weeks out of the gate. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. I think we're only going to increase. Next slide. Be flexible before and after COVID. Product shortages absolutely fo forced most of us to make some menu changes. We didn't know that we weren't going to get on something on the truck that we anticipated. So I think we need to be flexible for that. I really want people that are in school food service to realize that diversion is not mandatory. You don't have to send your poundage to some place to make something for you. You can use a raw item and do your scratch cooking. In our district, at least 75% of what we do is from scratch. We're not a huge district, so it's pretty easy for us to do. And probably the only things that I wouldn't change right away are my chicken patties and chicken nuggets and the things that every kid gets in line for because they're favorites. Budget constraints and labor constraints can play a big role in what most districts are able to do. We're going to be hearing from a food service operation in California a little bit later in this webinar. They have um, 25,000 plus kids in their district. There might be things that they couldn't do that a smaller district can do, but at the end of the day, 
whatever you can do that scratch cooking changes the perception for the community and for our kids. I'm always looking for a la carte revenue. And this year, primarily because we're CEP school, I need to know that I can make up the difference in revenue so that I'm as solvent as I can be at the end of the year. I do uh, surveys with my kids to find out what items they would like to have. And then I reach out to my vendors to see what I can find from brokers that meet my smart snack regulations so that I can offer those items. Sometimes the kids will only come in because they want a certain ice cream, but when they get here and see what we're serving, they might change their mind and have dinner. And make students feel welcome. Take advantage of any waivers that you can. This year, there aren't too many, um, but if, if they are available, you should be watching your child nutrition sites to see what's out there that can make your program function more easily. Next slide. Own it. The lady that you see to the left of me in this picture, her name is Helen Rose. This is her 40th year as a school um, head cook. She's been a head cook. She started as a dishwasher. She's gonna be 80 years old in April. And she sets the bar so high for myself and the rest of my team. It's just unbelievable. I worried when I came into this uh, school system, I was here like almost four years now. And I thought, oh my goodness, she's been here so long. Will she be flexible and can we do anything new? But let me tell you, she thrives on it. If you can get the buy-in from your staff and you have a great idea and can plant a couple seeds and show them that they can do it, empower them your program will flourish. I'm, I'm really proud of her. Next slide. Here she is again. During National School Breakfast Week, I always try to do something fun for the kids so that I can increase participation. This was last year. I went to our local Walmart and Target stores and asked if they would be willing to donate a bicycle or a bicycle helmet or a bicycle lock. I got one for each of my schools. And actually that's the fourth year I've done that. So I'm, I'm hoping that I'm making a suggestion somebody out there might be able to grasp onto and do it. I tracked the kids that came in in my elementary school. My girls um, tracked on a ticker, the kids that came in for every time they came in, they got their name put in a hat and we did a random number generator and some kid won the bike and the helmet. In the high school, I actually had the kids come in and write their name on a little, um, a little ballot. They put their name and their grade number and put it in the box. And I had a kid come in during lunch and we pulled that out and they got a new bike. It was uh, pretty, it was pretty fun. The kids loved it. We had the people here from the newspaper and they took pictures. They did a little interview with the kids and talked about our program. It was, uh, it was great. I think that the principal and maybe the teachers in our district looked at our operation a little bit differently after that one event, when I first started here, I think they realized that we were more than just grilled cheese sandwiches and tomato soup as the kids came through or peanut butter and jelly. We take an active interest in what the kids experience when they come in the cafeteria and little activities like this that don't really create a lot of work and don't cost any money at all. Didn't cost me a penny for this work. Those are the things that make the kids come. Next slide. Talked a little bit about social media and I'm gonna mention farm to school activities. October's farm to school month. So we know we should all be trying to serve what we can that's local. I belong to a local farm to school group. We have a little hub um, and that uh, entity brings local farm fresh products to our school districts. We never had that before. I do taste tests and try it Tuesdays in each school. Use bulletin boards that just have stickers that I get from our local Cornell Cooperative Extension. When the kids come through, they get a freebie to try if they want to, and they just put their sticker on that bulletin board. If they like something or don't like something, it gives me a little bit of an idea of what they might like, and we try to put on the following month's menu so the kids know we're listening to them. I do a lot of surveys. In the beginning of the year, I always try to do one for, for parents and students to find out why they don't come in for breakfast and what do they want that they're not getting. I was a little shocked last year to find out that some of our, my, the faculty in my district didn't really even know what we served. They have the misconception that we just have Pop-Tarts and Rice Krispie treats. And they don't know the difference between what we are able to serve and what they get at the grocery store. It's not the exact same thing and they didn't know that. My intern last year conducted a survey and she went into the classrooms and did um, 
little presentation, like an in-service, talked a little bit about a program called the Nudge Program. Um, I would highly recommend it for everyone in child nutrition. What we asked the teachers to do when the kids came in first period or even second period was to just say, hey guys, do you have breakfast today? Or what did you have? I could smell French toast in the hallway. Did you take advantage of that and have breakfast? After a few days, my participation in my high school building went up 11% for breakfast. I think that's a, a pretty astronomical number for the, the size of my district. And once they start coming, they keep coming. Then they dr drop some items in the, drop some suggestions in the suggestion box, and we kind of go from there. So we've been able to keep that momentum up a little bit. And with the help of No Kid Hungry, we've uh, applied for a couple of grants and we got portable cam cruiser kiosks so we can put some grab and go meals on and take it down the hall. So when the bell rings, the kids can stop and grab a quick meal and go right on to their next class. On our bulletin boards, we make sure that they're interactive and we let those kids know where to go to find those um, second chance cards and what we're offering each week on a menu so that they'll know to be able to come. And I would strongly encourage you to have your business official, officials, principals, nurses, especially your athletic director, come in and eat. Maybe they could come in and be a guest server. If the kids see those people in your cafeteria line, they're going to come out of curiosity and then they're gonna keep coming if your food is good. Next slide. How to get the buy-in from students. Next slide. Get to know your kids by name. I know when you're in a huge district, you're probably not able to do that. But I can tell you that Mrs. Rose being here 40 years, she probably knows at least 50% of the kids by their first name. And she knows if she served their parents or their brothers and sisters. The kids like being called by their first name. I try to do that in here. We do have brokers come in maybe four times a year. I invite someone that has an item that we haven't tried yet, they will come in and actually prepare the item, serve the item, and usually have some kind of a trivia game. Or last year, the picture that you can see is Tyson. My Tyson rep came. Um, she brought the McCain rep with her. We had some fries from McCain's and a new Tyson product. They brought in a cornhole board and the kids got to answer a trivia question. If it was right, they got a chance to throw their bean sack in the board and they won some kind of a prize. She had wristbands here and some little, those chickens that you squeeze, some sunglasses. The whole school was a buzz about it. I, I knew that it made a difference, but today I had a food forum kid in just this morning and said, you need to do some more of those contests. The kids are still talking about them. So that happened a year ago and she's remembering it. I have to try to do that again this, this year. Fun interactive ideas. We have a cupcake war in February and every year in December, we host a gingerbread making contest. And although those, those things are not directly related to the school meal program, they get the kids involved. If they know who you are and you can talk to them on a level that they understand, they'll come, their participation will increase. Next slide. Make your customers number one. Um, put a few pictures up of some fun things that we did this last year. In the elementary school, we drew on our string cheese for Dr. Seuss Day. The kids thought that was a really big deal. And in the high school building, I had kids ask for rainbow pancakes. So we made those for them. That was a big deal too. And in elementary, we did the little ghosts with Rice Krispie treats. I just dipped them in a little glaze and put some small uh, Hershey Kisses on them. Um, they loved them. Greet your customers with a smile and make every encounter with them be the best encounter, not just with your kids, but with your staff, with your administrative people. I try to have the bus drivers come in here when they do uh, safety meetings so that I can get to know who they are because they see those kids first thing every day. Ask them to tell the kids, don't forget to go have breakfast today. This is what we're serving. I think that makes a big difference in elementary school. Maybe not so much in high school, but I think it has made a little bit of an impact. So I think getting to know your transportation people is a, a bonus for you. Next slide. Remove the negativity. I wanted to talk just a little bit about the buy-in from our staff. I think in every business I've ever been in, not just school nutrition, but mostly school nutrition, someone has said to me, 
they won't like that. We've tried it already. We served that last year and it didn't go over very good. Kids don't want to eat breakfast. They're all, they're tired. They stay up too late at night. My kids didn't eat breakfast in the morning. So these kids don't want it either. And for me, that's all false. I think it's the way you approach what you're doing. And if you spin a positive note on it and make it fun, all those people that work for you will jump on the bandwagon with you. I've seen it in this district and in the district I was in previous to this. And I think that if you can just build those bridges, let them know that they can be great at what they do and they can make a real difference with these kids, it, it will prove, it will prove itself. Next slide. I think I'm at the end. Yes, that was amazing. Thank you, Deb. I took so many wonderful no notes. Um, uh, thank you for addressing the fact that negativity comes your way. At every single level, it comes your way and you have to essentially have a strategy to address it. Um, otherwise, it's just going to permeate everywhere. So really being mindful, knowing that that's going to come your way and um, knowing how to address it before, before you even have to really you know, before it's coming at you, thinking about it ahead of time. And then um, the nudges, someone asked about the nudges in the chat. I sent the uh, resource, No Kid Hungry has a resource it, on it. I will put that in the chat as well so everyone can see that. Um, but yeah, just suggesting, asking if kids have had breakfast. They might not have it on the brain because the mornings are so chaotic, but reminding them that is there is such uh, a smart thing to do. Um, the four Iron Chef competitions. I can't even believe that. I would love like a whole video on this. This sounds amazing and so much fun and such an engaging activity. And um, I also love that your students told you that Facebook was for old people and that, you know, you got to come to Instagram and you said, okay, I'm coming to Instagram. See you there. And you did. So that is fantastic. Thank you so much, Deb. Um, we are going to move on to Rialto right now, and then we'll circle back with questions at the very end of the webinar. So here is a uh, quick, uh, quick and dirty uh, look at Rialto. We're going to do a panel discussion with Rialto. So I'm just going to show this slide for just a minute. Um, we have Fawcett and Christina, and this is just a quick look at everything that they have going on in terms of serving their students. Um, like Deb mentioned earlier, 25,000 students, all found in three comprehensive high schools, one alternative adult education school, one continuation high school, five middle schools, 19 elementary schools, and 20 preschools. They have their work cut out for them. Um, so I'm happy to introduce Fawcett and Christina. Do you wanna say hello before we start our discussion? Sure, hello everyone. My name is Fausta Raman Davis. Um, the lead agent, really, that's basically, I'm um, the director of the program right here in Rialto. Very um, happy to be here this morning. Uh, good morning. I'm Christina Croucher. I'm the program innovator. So I handle a lot of the operations, social media, and our farm to cafeteria program. I'm going to take down the slide. Can we do that, Hannah, and just have our thumbnails up so the participants can really see our speakers? Fabulous. Okay. So you have so much going on in districts, so many students, crazy busy. Um, I'd love to know from your perspective, who is the most important stakeholder, the most important person to gain buy-in from, and why is that, that stakeholder so valuable? Well, obviously you would think the principal is the most important, but in reality, there's a concept of Ubuntu and we belong to a village. So our stakeholders actually is everyone, um, the principal, the teachers, the parents, and of course, most beloved, the students. So the first person you want to get a buy-in is the principal. It's very super important for him to really want to open the school for your program, especially in Rialto, all our schools, all the 29 schools, we have breakfast in classroom. And I just, we just achieved that last, last, last school year. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't something easy really, but it's something very, very persistent. It's something can, that can be done. I remember in California, LA University School District was the only school district at that time doing breakfast in classroom. So for me to really get that going with a principal, with the Board of Education, with the student, with the teachers, which very against it. So I took the principal, one of my high school, 
to um, an assistant principal, the custodian, to LA Unified School District. So we went to one of the high schools to see how things are done. So we're very open and very transparent. So the custodian who asked questions because he was very concerned about the trashes. You know, it's gonna be more work for me. This is not gonna be, but going over there so he can ask his own question and he can see how everything was flowing and everything was running smoothly. So we got his buy-in. So um, principal, yeah, because you wanna activate the program, you wanna really settle down the negative hostility towards your program before you even get it started on the, on the road. So that's what I think is very important. The principal as a leader to be buying, but don't forget the other stakeholders as well. You want well, to ask yeah. uh, a lot, a lot of times they don't understand, like we're not educators on that part and they're not food service people. So they don't have a visual or a concept of what it is that, you know, we're asking of them all it's immediately, they, they hit the floor running going, you're going to take away education minutes. It's, it's what all the negative impact is. And when they get the whole picture that we're really trying to create the whole child, we're, we're wanting to help support their education throughout the day. And then they really see what the vision is, then it's much easier for them to relate to what we're trying to bring to them. Yeah. And, and if, if you, if you know, it, you all go back to equity piece for us in reality, for, for us, for me, um, to lead this group for breakfast in classroom is very important to me because it, due, to, due to my background, um, um, coming from a background of where food was scarce, it was very difficult to have breakfast, to have the three whole meals a day. That make it a passion for me and a mission for me to make sure every kid in Rialto have opportunity to eat, not just um, rushing in the morning to the cafeteria, but to have a sit down with their friends and teachers to have that breakfast. Commonality, uh, that mental stress, that emotional focus. So it was really critical for me to make sure I have this implemented. And the equity piece comes in because that everybody is sitting down having the same thing to eat at the same time. So it is very important for me. And when I buy, when I, when we have the principal buy in, they can sell it. That yeah. is wonderful. Oh, I'm sorry. Keep going. No, 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 no. Yeah, I just agree with what said. Uh, this is fantastic. And okay, so such good information. And yes, so many valuable stakeholders in the district. Um, and being able to focus in on the principal for very specific reason and helping you're right, education folks are not in the nutrition space and vice versa. And so you really do have to help them visualize what these programs look like and how they are enriching for everybody for every stakeholder. Um, so, okay, so what happens when you have a principal who's completely new or doesn't know anything about breakfast after the bell? How do you um, create buy-in? How do you even approach them about this subject? Well, if a principal is new, since I have other principals already administering the program, so we have a sit-down talk conversation. And then I would like, um, I have a group of principals that really advocate, they move from one side of the of the street to the other side to our side so um i, I will include we have a meeting with the new principal and then you know we are meeting with the other principals so they have conversation going and just to be open the new principal concerns is being addressed whatever issue we're very very open negative bad and then we, we give the solution we have the concern okay let's look at it we'll do this we're very very open in reato and that make it easier for, and sometimes we have to do small adjustment also, even with the new principle, and then we make it work. Um, Usually we'll start with something as simple as like, what have they, what have they heard about the program? What do they know about, um, you know, breakfast after the bell? Do they know anything about our program? And have a very small conversation, just one-on-one -on -one with that administrator. Yeah, starting out level setting information, that way you know how to approach them because that they already have a specific mindset of how things are, yeah. Um, and then I love just the peer-to-peer -peer connections, making those principal peer-to-peer -peer connect connections because that's such a powerful um, connection. Okay, so let's see, you talked about um, new principles, you talked about the importance of uh, various stakeholders. So what are, so principals are have a million people coming to them every single day, every single week with all kinds of asks. What are some of those priorities that you know that principals have that you can tie back to breakfast after the, after the bell supporting those principals? Like how are you sending the message and selling breakfast after the bell as we can actually help you? We can help your priorities. Yeah, one of the um, things I would say is tidiness, attendance. 
So when you have breakfast in classroom, I mean, he wants to get there. They want to eat with their with, with their with their friends and they will not be in there, you're eating with the teacher. So it's different kind of atmosphere. So what we have seen since we went breakfast in the classroom, the attendance has gone up. What about that school district? Attendance has gone down. For real, the attendance has gone up because the kids say, I don't want to miss, I'll tell mom, I don't want to miss my breakfast. So um, so since then, um, it's really become something that the principal really, really- um, there, there, It's something that's helping, that's a positive that they're seeing um, that, that the program is really, um, kicking off that school day. And not only that too, and um, the nurses, there's a decline. Um, student going to the nurses to say, my stomach hurt, I'm hungry, or something's wrong with me, but they're not really, something's not really wrong with them. They're just hungry. So that's really up them in that way. So it's really a great um, overall positive thing for them to do for their school and to really cut down on tidiness and increase attendance. There's also the, um, there's a social emotional aspect to the to breakfast and um I know Fawcett Fawcett seen that firsthand and with one of our um one of our classrooms at one of our high schools and did you want to share that with them about the how the the students were actually sitting down and uh, many of our students said that that was the only meal that they actually get to enjoy with with other people that most of the time that they're enjoying meals they they're just on their own their parents are working uh you know, maybe they don't have siblings at home or whatever it is, but that they actually get to sit down with people, there's conversation, and then the teachers are stating that they know that those students, and it be it first period, we had some that had it second period, at that first of the day, those are the kids that they know better than any of their other students because there's different conversations going on other than homework and education. So they really get to, to know about those kids and learn about maybe what's going on at home and that there's a different level of assistance going on with those students, and um, and it was it was a positive side effect that, you know, we knew that there was some really good things going on about tardiness and making sure they had food, but that part of it we didn't even anticipate the growth and how that would really help the kids. That's really wonderful to hear. Have you had a principal ask for statistics, like on the tardiness, on the school nurse visits, on all of those things? I'm wondering if you've had a, just a really resistant principal that was like, okay, yeah, well, you're just talk. This is talk. Show me the numbers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, um, before we finally went all breakfast in classroom. So high school was pretty easy for us. The principal were on board most of the time. And then uh, elementary school was not too bad, but middle schools was very tough to really convince all these principals to go breakfast in classroom. They aired out forever, for months and stuff. So one of the principals, we had a principal meeting and about this breakfast in classroom, open forum, asking questionnaire. And he told me, really, what's your um, what's your data? My school is already um, national school, the best school, whatever. Yeah, my, my school, what else can you do for me? My school's already got the best testing. Testing, you know, and so what else can you do for me? Um, I'm the principal and you're not the principal and I don't need this program in my school. All this stuff was going on. So I, of course, I tried to calm down and say, look, it's not only for that, even without being having a good test course, just for the um, attendance, emotional well-being, other area that this can help you with your student. Um, at least it was back and forth, back and forth. At the end, he did it. He, he, of course, we all breakfast in classroom. It was the last school. <coughs> and then, so later on, he had an interview to move on to another position in the district. And one of the questions that was asked him, what was your regret? And he, did, he said, my regret is not having breakfast in the classroom earlier on. How he fought against it. And the impact that he's seen, you know, um, is incredible, amazing. And, and the student behavior, their well-being, and and not only for for this for the score fully, I'm seeing fully next year they will even go up higher in their score. Um, so that's really really it. That's amen for me. Um, like at least we're doing something good for for our scholars in Rayato. And I'm glad you bring that up in terms of the actual timeline, like how long it takes to get buy-in from some of these principals because it it can take months and months and months and so how yes. do you keep approaching the principal yeah. keeping you know uh, keeping your point bolstering your point without being sort of um 
too much, you know, intrusive in, in his or her day? Like, how do you, how do you, um, yeah, yeah, you know, continue you know, over months of communication to try to get buy-in? Yeah. Yeah. You know, like I said, some people were very, really like, okay, this is good for our scholar. We're going to do things in the best interest of our students. Okay. I'll pilot it and I always give them a way out. If it doesn't work, look, we back out, back out of it. You know, I don't make it like you must do this and stuff. So, but then for those, those other principles, so I try to connect with them, you know, I go to the principal meeting, I check in with them and say this option is still available. Um, sometimes call it brass, I'll, I'll come, can I have a meeting with you? Maybe like in, you have a thing open like in a, in a month. So I go take a tea with them and we still have conversation. This is really good. And some of them tell me it's not just them as well. Some teacher in their school, they're very, very against it. This will not work in this school. But you have to be persistent and you have to have, to have that per perseverance. If you want something and you know you're doing something from your art, you know, it might take longer. It took me for this middle school, it took me like four years, you know, four years, you know. Um, and I, I, usually I don't, I, mean, I don't give up easily. And um, even with all the attacks and everything, I just said, well, they know they will get it. They will come around, you know, say no hundred times. I go back, you know, nice about it and said, you know, I know you love your student. I know you want to do what's good for your student. And what can I do for you? How can I help you? You know, some of the principal told me, okay, you have to, can you buy me trash? I bought some of the principal I have to pay for golf cart because of consider complaint. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll buy your supply. I will do this for you. I'll buy whatever you need for you. You know, I got a lot of grants, but sometimes from no kid hungry to use as a funding for this. So, and I got a lot of money that I could use just to make sure we have what's good for our scholars. And, um, and eventually they all, body into the program they so, had, yeah they had nowhere else to go it's yeah. like when they're right. like um you know we we like the breakfast pizza but it's greasy and it's like okay so we do a breakfast we do a pizza pocket or we change the menu we have a conversation with them you know the kids you know we don't want this but the kids love this or we do this. so we have those like open conversations go back and forth and you know the kids love cereal the teachers hate it when we have cereal, but we work it into the menu to where it's they get national cereal day, the entire district is getting cereal milk that day. And so, and it works out great. Um, you know, and then sometimes it's just like, they really don't have nowhere else to go. And we say, send us all of your questions. We'll answer all the questions and we'll create a document and everybody can see the questions and answers in live time. And it's like, then we don't get any after that initial thing, we maybe get one or two, but it's, Okay, well, they asked for this equipment. They said yes. Okay, they asked, okay, they said yes. Okay, now what? Yeah. It's I, like, you know, they, they're expecting us to say no, but then we say yes. Yeah, and... I remember one of the elementary schools, um, principal, very tough principal. Um, and the teachers over there, the school was like, oh my God. Um, so finally, um, very fast in the classroom was implemented at that school. But then teacher, we we have a um the bread, what do you call it? Uh panduce, yeah, the pink panduce bread. And they went on riot. Man, the teachers like, get this out of my school. This is my company, is this and that and that. And at the end, we have to adjust. We did take that plan to say of the thing because I have to look for the, am I going to fight this one fight of one thing or, or get rid of the program, you know, and stuff. So we, we change it with something closer, but doesn't have any crumbs on top of it. So, you know, you have to be, be able to be flexible, adjust and adapt to make things work sometimes. You know, it's not 100% your way. If one, if one of yeah. the I feel like the name of the game is just adaptability, constant, constant adaptability for everything that's happening. Um, okay. So let's say now you have your principles on board, buying has happened, programs are running smooth. How do you maintain those relationships with those stakeholders in your district? Like, do you have a feedback loop that's built in? Yeah, yeah we, we do. Um, I mean, we listen, the ultimate goal of this program is to continue forever so if you're not going to listen and things come out arise you have new teacher new principal new what have you and then we listen to the concern we listen to the feedback what's working what's not working and like you just said before we have to adapt you have to keep changing if you want to be on this game you have to do that and uh, we have to be open-minded and sometimes they give us great ideas we don't know it all i always tell them i'm a director but i don't know it all at me we're very also involved like um like um, New York, we're very involved with the student uh, um, body. We have a student association that we get involved with. We have they go with us to the conference every year. We have they do a test test. You know, every month we have a test test going on. We have also you no, know, we have parent PTA, which some of my staff, some of my member uh, uh, leadership, they're involved in it. They're part of the member of PTA. We something strong, so we get feedback from the PTA. So we're so into everything that's going on in the district outside the district. So 
is very, very, and which actually give us a great advantage, where even when something is wrong. Um, so we open, listen to them, and then we make the adjustment. You know, and we use our social media platform a lot. Um, and we don't, we don't shy away when they're, if they're making a, um, I don't want to say negative so much, but like if they're trying to be constructive about what's being served or maybe what they haven't seen on the menu, um, they will, um, they will post it and we will reply and we will reply with every comment. Um, sometimes it is a, a reply to please contact our office because we want, you know, we don't want that back and forth to kind of go on, but we want to be able to explain what's happening. Uh, by far, Instagram is one of our, our most popular platforms, but we're on all of them. We're, you know, if they probably make a new platform, we'll probably be on that one too. Um, but Facebook is, is popular um, for the parents, mostly, mostly the parents. We, we've got TikTok, we're doing LinkedIn and, uh, and Twitter, well, formerly no X, whatever it's called now, but, um, that one, and it, it really is a, um, a nice avenue that the kids, even if they're not commenting, they're telling us they're seeing it. Yeah. Um, we didn't realize that you guys made that in our kitchens every morning. We didn't realize that you guys were cooking that. We did a live this morning. We are making a uh, fresh chow mein for our middle or for our elementaries and our preschools. And they had a uh, chow mein and this is the second time it's been on the menu. And so we were showing that process in our central kitchen this morning on how that was made. And so we do get um, some really great feedback from the families who don't realize that, you know, even though it's coming, maybe it's a package because our middle schools and high schools, everything is packaged, that they're not realizing that those items are this way. So we talk about our nutrition education and our breakfast, we do have homemade, we do banana bread. And so we will make the banana bread. We cut it up. We, we put it in packages and the kids are getting fresh banana bread for our breakfast in the classroom programs. And so when we show that and we explain that to our families via social media, and we do see a spike in the participation of that particular item. And they're like, I didn't realize it. They just thought it was generic packaging. It's like, no, we made that from scratch this morning. Yeah, and some of the stuff, even from the gardens, they're coming from the, I mean, during the orange time, the, the orchard, we produce enough oranges for all our schools. So those wow. will go out and then she'll put the highlight on it and stuff. So really um, support, like, they have any concern, any complaint, we listen. Like I was telling you about the custodian, it's like, well, can I have more trash bag? Of course you can have more trash bag. Can I have this? Of course you can have that. And trying to make their life simple and easier and say, we're always there for you. We come to support whatever question that you have. So like she said, we don't shy off anything, whether good, bad, or ugly. We're always there. Um, and that means, means a lot to all of them. You're the yes people. You want to make good things happen. You're the yes people. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you could say no is the way it's, it's delivery of the message. Sometimes I, can, I, I can't do that, but I could do this for you. Right. Yes. Right. Um, I also love how you talked about showcasing how the foods are made, what goes into the foods, what the process is, because people have their own assumptions and it might not be anything close to re the reality. And so showing them, educating them, changing their perceptions, and then seeing participation increases as a result and just more satisfaction with the program all around. So that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Even for our middle school and high school, we have students actually deliver the bags. We don't even do that. We're so, there was so much buy-in that the high school kids, they come and pick up their bag from the cafeteria and take it to the classroom, you know, and then bring the bag back. So that's how much we work together. So, and that even spare me labor. I don't have to use my labor to do that. And the same thing at the middle schools. So at the, at the elementary school, they have leadership students that help. So, and the parents, even come to the camp and they saw this at first they say my kids gonna be dragging this but they saw the kids were so happy doing this kind of like leadership i get to go bring the bag from the cafeteria so all those is everybody working together for the yeah. same goal the yeah. holistic approach for, yeah. for our scholars yeah they have ownership in the program yes absolutely this is fantastic. We are entering into the Q&A phase of the webinar, and I'm going to keep us in the thumbnails. We do have a Q&A slide, but we won't put it up. I think it's better to see your faces as you chat. So there were some Q&A. Um, there were some questions in the Q&A box, and I think all of them have been answered. Thank you, Deb, for answering those in real time. Um, so folks, you can continue to put questions in the chat box, or you can, um, or excuse me, the Q&A box, or you can put them right in the chat box. And we will um, answer them. Deb um, and Fossad and uh, Christina, was there anything that I didn't give you a chance to cover? Like 
is there as as we're talking through this and you're hearing about each other's programs, is there anything else that comes to mind that you think is important to to chat about or say? Well, I, I know that for us with the the breakfast after the the bell program, you know, we've tried all models. So we had a high school that they started with the second chance breakfast and it did not work. It did not work for them um, because students were gonna were being tardy. So it's like, they asked, they're like, we want to, we want to change every, we want breakfast in the classroom. And so, and then that particular principal actually became an advocate for us for a breakfast in the classroom, because she was able to firsthand explain how second chance breakfast does not work when you have, you know, yeah, 3000 kids coming out at the same time, trying to eat, no matter how many points of sale you have. We have this year, we had, um, we have one of our schools, um, we have our high schools are on a late start. And so the, the time most of our high schools were having breakfast in second period because that's where they had their announcements. And this particular school was our first high school that went breakfast um, in the classroom. And that was, we kind of targeted their second period saying, hey, our seniors will be here and stuff and kind of modeled at that. Well, now having conversations with the principal this year, seeing how things are working out, we're finding out that her kids are waiting to come to school until second period because they want to have breakfast. So they're not going to get breakfast in first, so they're not coming. So now we're going to push, we're looking to make it the first of the day. And so that she can start rectifying some of those tardies because it wasn't, a, it wasn't anything that was there before they were actually on kids were coming to school, but this, after they've come back from, from COVID. And even though we've been back now for a couple of years, it's, they're still, they're fine. We're finding new things that have become new challenges. And that's, that's one of them with the late start and the kids are like, oh, why do I need to go if breakfast is not happening yet? Yeah, basically, I mean, all schools, we're all different. I mean, we, ultimately, we have, we have the same goal. We want to feed our scholars, right? But different models might be good. What's good in reality might not be good for someone in New York. And what's, so, I mean, but there's different models that you could try. There's one, two, three. So I'm sure one of them will fit in in any of the schools. Thank you for that. And Deb, I saw you come off mute. What else would you like to add? I was just thinking about, we had breakfast in the classroom in my elementary school during COVID and the teachers had a shared Google sheet and they just made a click in the box if the kid had breakfast that day. The biggest challenge for us during that time was allergies. I mean, we're not a very big school district, but holy moly, we got a lot of allergies in elementary. In my high school, I'm finding that whole get off the bus, smell the food cooking, come in, grab the meal, take it to your classroom. It all works. So I, I agree with Fausat that you've got to look at all the models because maybe what works in one school doesn't work for another, but there's always another alternative. Yeah. We're talking a lot about the buy-in with everybody. Uh, you know, I'll reiterate the bus drivers, the school nurse. Um, years ago, the school nurse would come in in the morning and when everybody's done eating, scoop up all the milk and snacks and take them back to their um office and if some kid came in not feeling well they had a mac of uh, milk and snacks that kind of thing isn't happening now right right with this not happening so you know those nurses when the kids come in and they're not feeling great might say did you have a breakfast yet and touch base with the cafeteria can i send susie down she's not feeling good yeah we so. had some of the resistance that we had with um, some of our administrators was you're already feeding the majority of the population breakfast and we knew that that wasn't the case that you know, middle school and high school, it's like, we're, you know, you got the high school, you got 3000 kids on campus and we're feeding like a couple hundred yeah. because they don't want to get up. They don't want to get yeah. there. Or maybe the bus is running late. And it's like, and we switch over to breakfast in the classroom and the first day and we're feeding like, you know, 2,600 kids right. on the first day. And it's like, holy moly. It's like, it just exploded. And so we go from, you know, a 30% participation, maybe up to a 95% participation on a daily. That's great and stuff. And so the, those kids are they're they're getting the fuel so they can pay attention in their classroom. And that and that ups your budget too. Also yeah. too, I mean, yes, yeah. you know, it's, it's a lot of um, give you a lot of budget money too. I have a group of special ed kids that come into my cafeteria. They started coming the year before last, so they came at the end of the day and like filled snack racks and filled my ice cream cooler and learned some life skills. I gave mm -hmm. them achievement award certificates and they were honored at our board of ed meeting and none of those kids came in here to eat ever breakfast or lunch um some just anxiety with large groups and all that so we made 
um, some arrangements so that they could come in earlier or later, or we have, they pre-order their meal, we had it ready. So now some of those kids have come out of their shell and they're talking to other kids about coming to eat. So sometimes you're just going to find some little, little group of people that you can make a change with. I do an athlete's meal dinners to go. So I have a pre-order thing. It's not a reimbursable meal. These kids got to pay for this or mom's got to pay for it. But the kid can come in at breakfast and order their takeout dinner meal. And we have it ready before they hop on the bus to go to a game. Those kids that never came for breakfast before know they want to take their Caesar salad on the bus. And now they're here and they're eating pancakes. So sometimes you just got to think outside the box. How are you going to capture your audience? What is the interest to get them in there? And once you get them here, you're just going to feed them every meal. Yeah. So it's just thinking outside the box. Thinking outside the box. And there is a question in the chat. Just think Cass there's no, actually in Rialto, there's no bus. We don't have no buses. There's no, no buses. I like yeah, that. No boxes. Just yeah, there's no boxes. Destroy the box. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Um, okay, so we have a chat in the chat box. Kathy says she's struggling with breakfast at her middle school, and she wants advice on how she can increase her participation with this group. She says she's doing it in the classrooms, but teachers do not like the mess. She says now they're doing grab-and-go meals, but the participation is very low. So what advice do you have for Kathy? Well, I know I know from us when we had some um, – we, we were monitoring the participation in the middle school because we struggled. And in the beginning, when we had classrooms, they weren't eating at that age. It's not cool. It's like, they don't, it's a, there's this whole thing. It's like, Oh, I don't want to eat around them. You know, I, I don't eat or, or whatever it is. It's more cool not to eat. Uh, we had a supervisor and she would go into the classroom and talk to the kids and it wasn't talking and talk to the principal and stuff, but it was mostly having that conversation with the students. It's like, why aren't you eating here? Try it. I'm going to eat it. You try it. And it's like, everybody eat it. We, you know, we had some like where we were enticing them to, you know, at least give it a try, worked with the, a couple of the classrooms and say, if we had four classrooms and none of those classrooms were eating and, you know, you know, we all, we did something for them or whatever it was and to get them. And now those kids became participating in that, in that program. And it might've been where they were just like, you know, can we have this instead? Mm -hmm. Do you have that? Or during lunchtime, we're going out during lunchtime and letting them taste test the, some of the stuff that's on the menu at breakfast that they're not eating. And then they're like, well, when did you have that? And it's like, we had that for breakfast two days ago, but you guys didn't eat it. And then it's like, and then slowly they start to kind of come around. Um, and then you have to look too, is like, is if your teacher, is your teacher helping it or hindering the program? We found that we did have some of our teachers who didn't even open the bags in the morning. Yeah. They set them in there. And if the kids didn't touch the bags, the bags got set back with everything in it. So we, we we had to go back in there and we had to check and we had to open them up and encourage the kids they could get into it. Um, we had a teacher who wouldn't let the kids eat in her classroom and she sent them outside regardless of what the weather was. And so sometimes you have to work with your administrators and say, hey, can you help us out with this and and stuff? But usually those are very far and few between. And once you work with one, you get one person who's going to buy into what's happening. It will help you with the others. Exactly. I've done a couple of contests in our district, not just for National School Breakfast Week, where I, you know, ran around and got a bicycle and got donations, but in my, you know, National School Lunch Week's coming up and we're going to level up in my district this year. And I will have a challenge with the grade level that eats the most breakfast during National School Lunch Week. And because we're CEP, I can give those kids a pizza party. It won't cost me a penny. It'll be a reimbursable meal. I'm going to feed them all. And maybe some mom or some teacher, or maybe just me, because, you know, you foot the bill for some stuff to get your kids come. We'll, we'll throw in the pizza. So sometimes it's a challenge. The kids want to know. Right now on our bulletin board, my intern put, came and took a headshot of all of us. And, if the, and we each gave a fact about ourselves that most people wouldn't know about. So this is on my big hall bulletin board, my middle high school, with a little ballot. Gives the names of all the... Um, lunch ladies. The kids have to take that ballot, match the fact to the lunch lady, put their name on the back, <laughs> drop it in my suggestion box. At the end of this week, everybody who got all of them right will go on a hat and I'm going to foot the bill for a free ice cream every day for the week. This could cost me a buck and a half. So for me, um, sometimes that's just what you got to do. Maybe I'm going to save my empty water bottle so I have a little slush fund and I can, you know, do some things that cost a few bucks and 
not have to, I, I can't pay for that stuff out of my program budget. So I have to be creative about where I can get some money to do fun things to get kids involved. So today during lunch, my longest lunch line, I went out with all those ballots and walked around to each kid and asked if they knew what it was and told them I expect to see my, my suggestion box full tomorrow. And so he's going to get ice cream. They'll be all pumped up about that. And That's just, so yeah. fun. Yeah. That's so yeah. fun. Yeah. I want to be conscious of time. I'm so sorry. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> this has been so wonderful. Hannah, will you just throw up the last couple slides? Um, Cause I just have a few final announcements. Um, so we can breeze through the Q&A. This is just a way to stay in touch. We have our newsletter, tons of resources on our website. This webinar will be sent out along with the slides. Next slide, Hannah. And then we will do a um, quick feedback, uh, a questionnaire at the end of this webinar. This helps us determine what uh, subjects we have on webinars, what we talk about, how often we have webinars. So we do really appreciate this feedback. We read everything that you send our way, all the comments. So please um, take a moment to complete the, the survey. And then I think we have one more slide. Yep. And this is me, Summer Creek Souser, and this is how you can reach out to me. And so I want to thank our speakers. Thank you so much. You all do such amazing work, and I'm so delighted that you're able to share your best practices um, and your creative and innovative solutions with our audience today. So thank you all, and have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Bye.